be discussing septic arthritis or infectious arthritis. Today we will discuss septic arthritis. Septic arthritis or infectious arthritis is an infection of a joint by a microorganism leading to inflammation that is the progression or migration of phagocytes and polymorphonuclear neutrophils into the joint, release of proteolytic enzymes, and this can lead to damage of the joint and destruction of the joint. What causes septic arthritis? The bacteria can enter the joint either hematogenously, that is via the blood, or can be introduced directly, such as during a surgery or joint aspiration by a physician, or from an adjacent osteomyelitis, that is infection of the bone, or lastly from a penetrating wound. Now predisposing factors are important. People can have bacteremia or bacteria in the blood for many reasons, however this doesn't necessarily lead to an infectious or septic arthritis. People at risk for this have compromised host defenses or a history of previous joint damage and these can predispose to septic arthritis. Things such as rheumatoid arthritis that leads to the damaged joint and is a good nidus for infections, or the medications that are used to treat this, such as corticosteroids, cytotoxic drugs, or other immunosuppressive medicines that can compromise the immune system. Crystal-induced arthritis can have enzymatic strip mining of the cartilage, leading to a substrate for possible infection. Severe osteoarthritis, such as occurs in a charcoal joint or hemoarthrosis, as one sees in hemophilia, can leave one at risk. Chronic systemic diseases, such which suppress the host defense, including systemic lupus erythematosus, sickle cell disease, cancer, or the medications that treat these diseases can increase the risk. Prosthetic joints have an increased risk, as does any foreign body that is placed inside the human cavity, since there is a risk for bacterial attaching during bacteremia. Intravenous drug use can lead to this because there is a recurrent bacteremia, as the IV drug abuser commonly or significantly uses dirty needles. Infections can be introduced iatrogenically by the surgeon or other physician during an inoculation of a joint or joint surgery. Now the bacteria that cause septic arthritis are most commonly the gram-positive cocci, specifically Staphylococcus aureus. This can cause up to 60% of the gram-positive infections, whereas beta-hemolytic strip only causes about 10 to 30% of the non-gonococcal bacteria arthritis. When gram-negative bacilli are encountered in the joint, one must be concerned about another underlying condition. Commonly, these are, these are from the skin or urine. For instance, E. coli septic arthritis occurs more common in the elderly during, due to frequent urinary tract infections. Serration marcescens or Pseudomonas aeruginosus are more common among IV drug abusers. If one sees Pastorella multiceta, one should consider the animal bite in the joint. Anaerobic bacterial infection of the joint occur much less often, however they are now being found more frequently as there are better culture techniques. A clue that one has an anaerobic infection in the joint would be a foul-smelling synovial fluid or gas seen in the joint on x-ray. Tuberculous arthritis again is not common, however diagnosis can be very difficult. Systemic, manifestation, systemic manifestations may or may not be present and the chest x-ray may be only positive in about half the cases. Vertebral tuberculosis or POTS disease accounts for about half of the skeletal involvement with tuberculosis. Synovial fluid analysis only yields positive smears or cultures in about 20 to 80 percent of the cases, and a synovial biopsy may be no needed in order to make the diagnosis. Lastly, a typical mycobacteria needs to be considered given the increased incidence of immunosuppression, either by diseases such as HIV or by the multiple immune suppressing medications that are currently being used to treat autoimmune disease. Lastly, fungal infections need to be considered in an acute monoarthritis or especially in a chronic indolent monoarthritis that is undiagnosed with destruction of the joint. 
Indeed, the course of a fungal arthritis can be very indolent and may lead to delays in diagnosis of months or even years. Pathologically, we find a subsynovial space where the bacteria are trapped contains an abundant of polymorphonuclear neutrophils and phagocytosis of the organisms by the polymorphonuclear cells and the synovial lining cells. There is neovascularization, probably some down here, and synovial proliferation, and we talked about that in rheumatoid arthritis, same type of thing. There's granula granulation tissue and cartilage destruction, thus it is d damaging the joint. The polymorphonuclear cells rapidly fill the joint cavity, causing a purulent synovial fluid. I've already discussed the pathophysiology of this when I gave the definition. However, this is just a reminder. The bacteria can either enter the joint hematogenously via the blood or directly via surgery or injection, such as shown here, or a penetrating wound or damage, or from adjacent osteomyelitis. After this occurs, the synovial phagocytes and polymorphonuclear neutrophils engulf the bacteria abscesses form and the polymorphonuclear cells pour into the joint. The synovial cells and the polymorphonuclear neutrophils release proteolytic enzymes that can cause synovial damage, cartilage damage, and bone necrosis. And this is where the permanent damage occurs. Granulation tissue will form. The classic presentation is that of a sudden, painful, hot, and swollen joint. Generally, it is only one joint, that is a monoarthritis, however, multiple joints, such as a polyarthritis, can occur. If there is multiple joint involvement, there is probably a significant serious underlying chronic illness, such as rheumatoid, cancer, etc. The mortality of polyarticular bacteria arthritis is twice that of monoarthritis. In this slide, one can see a red hot joint, shown here there is actually a sinus tract with purulent drainage. With respect to the history and physical examination, the presentation is noted above. Again, a red hot joint, sudden onset. With respect to the history, one should try to tickle out a question about the predisposing conditions that we noted above. The patient may be febrile, but not necessarily. The differential diagnosis includes anything that can cause a sudden onset of a red hot swollen joint. And indeed, we discussed gout and pseudogout in the previous talks. And these can look most often like a septic arthritis. But other conditions that c cause a monoarthritis need also be considered, such as Lyme disease, viral arthritis, acute traumatic or hemorrhagic arthritis, Reiter's syndrome, or other seronegative spondyl arthropathies can present with a, po a mono or a posse arthritis. And then other types of inflammatory arthritis that are polyarticular can present as a monoarthritis, such as rheumatoid. The most important diagnostic procedure which should be performed when assessing acute or hot swollen joint is aspiration. I will give a separate talk about aspiration and analysis of the synovial fluid. However, it is important that the synovial fluid should be evaluated for cell count, gram stain, culture, and crystal analysis. Other studies that are performed include a complete blood count, looking for evidence of an elevated white count. The sedimentation rate is followed as this is frequently elevated. X-rays or other imaging should be considered. First, I'm looking for evidence of an underlying bone or joint disease, but secondly, this also gives a baseline for comparison in the future as we consider other treatment. For joints that are difficult to evaluate with X-ray, then either a CT scan or an MRI should be considered. If the organism that is isolated can be associated with endocarditis, such as Staphylococcal aureus, Streptococci, or Enterococci, then evaluation for endocarditis with uh, either an echocardiogram or a transesophageal echo needs to be done. The hallmarks of treatment are the same as those as for other infections in any location. Adequate drainage needs to be done and systemic antibiotic therapy. The drainage can be accomplished by either serial needle aspirations, 
or more invasively by arthroscopy or surgery. With respect to antibiotic selection, if the gram stain does show a gram positive coccus, then vancomycin should be used until the organism pr is proven not to be a methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, that is MRSA. If the gram stain is negative and the patient is ultimately in otherwise good health, then the treatment should be vancomycin. If there are any underlying risk factors and the gram stain is negative, then the treatment should include vancomycin with treatment for pseudomonas. Lastly, if the gram stain shows a gram negative rod, then an anti pseudomonal regimen should be used. F finally, if a gram negative coccus is found on gram stain, then there is concern for Neisseria gonorrhea and ceftriaxone should be used. Generally, antibiotic treatment lasts from two to six weeks, which initially is IV, but then can be changed to oral. It is important to note that this is a medical emergency and that late or inadequate treatment can lead to permanent damage to the joint or even death. Gynecocal arthritis is a special subset of infectious arthritis. It needs to be considered when one encounters a mono or a posse arthritis. It does differ from non-gonococcal septic arthritis with respect to demographics, presentation, and treatment. Disseminated gonococcal infection is caused by sexually transmitted Neisseria gonorrheal infection. Unfortunately, Neisseria meningitidis can look very similar to disseminated gonococcal infection or GGI. Although the meningitis infection is generally much more serious and life threatening. People at particular risk for DGI are young, sexually active adults. However, one cannot rule this infection out in the elderly or the very young. If it is found in the very young, then child abuse needs to be evaluated. The risk is increased during menses or pregnancy. Patients with terminal complement deficiencies of C5 through 9 can have an increased risk of recurrent Neisseria bacteremia. There should definitely be a workup for terminal complement deficiencies in somebody that's had more than one bout of disseminated gonococcal infection. Cultures are only positive of the synovial fluid in about 25% of the cases for this. With respect to presentation, the patients will have a migratory polyarthralgia. Thus, it's a little different than septic non gonococcal arthritis, which stays in one joint, generally occurring three to five days prior to diagnosis. The physical examination reveals an arthritis in one or several joints, tenosynovitis, can have a purulent tenosynovitis, a rash or dermatitis, and fever. They can have skin changes such as this pustule and boli shown here. This is another example of a pustule associated with disseminated gonococcal infection. With respect to the history and physical, it is very important to take a sexual history in a patient that presents with a new onset of monoarthritis or polyarthritis. The differential diagnosis includes anything that can be associated with rash and arthritis such as systemic lupus erythematosus. Lyme arthritis, bacterial endocarditis, and as we discussed, Neisseria meningitis. The special studies that need to be performed in evaluating this include culture of the synovial fluid, but also the blood, the urethra in the male, and the cervix in the female, the rectum, and the throat. If Neisseria gonorrhea is found, then one should check for other sexually transmitted disease such as chlamydia, syphilis, HIV, MPOX, etc. Spinal fluids should be taken in and cultured if there is any concern at all about Neisseria meningitis. Now treatment for this is pretty easy actually. Generally it is a beta lactamase resistant cephalosporin such as ceftriaxone. Generally, there's defervescence or the fever goes away in 24 to 48 hours. Sexual contacts do need to be notified, however. Serial needle drainage or surgical drainage of the joint is not required for this. Well, I thank you for listening to my talk today. I will follow this 
ultimately with the discussion about the approach to monoarthritis. Again, the, dis the talks of gout and pseudogout are very pertinent to this as those can be associated with a sudden onset of a hot inflamed joint. Thank you for coming to my talk. The next discussion will be on the approach to acute inflammatory monoarthritis. Mm -hmm.